Hola dudes and dudettes, in this video I'm going to talk about the three major skills of sound recognition that you need to develop in order to do your own accurate guitar transcriptions. The key word here is skill. You can definitely learn this. It's not something that just some people are born with and others are not. Hey, if we haven't met or it's your first time on this channel, I'm Jeff Allard, aka The Details Dude here at your service to help you get better faster at guitar with learning by listening. We'll also be bringing you detailed tutorials on how to play classic rock songs just like they are on the record. So if you're interested in taking your playing to the next level please hit that pretty subscribe button below. So this week we're going to dive into the um, the learning by listening aspect of my pledge to help you get better on guitar. As you develop your own transcribing skills, there's so many clues as to what's going on in the song if you just knew what to listen for. And watch too. Don't forget to watch videos on YouTube. You know, I know a lot of artists improvise live and stuff, but you can get some pretty sweet insights by watching them play their own music live even if it's just as simple as what position they're playing a riff in. Taking advantage of the tools we have available isn't cheating, it's smart. If you can improve your recognition of the three characteristics of sound that I'm about to reveal, you'll be well on your way to playing your favorite songs, becoming a better guitarist and musician. And let me reiterate, anybody can do this. It's a skill, not a natural born talent. Make sure to stick around until the end because I have a bonus tip for you too. The three main listening skills you need to improve are recognition of the following three sound qualities. Uh, pitch or frequency, timbre, sometimes called tone color, and articulation or execution, how the notes are played. Now we'll just kind of go a little bit into each one of those topics. All right, so pitch is um, is this, is also frequency, and this one is like scientifically measurable and defined. Frequency, it's in hertz, which is cycles per second. So um, each pitch has its own frequency, and whatever the sound wave looks like. Um, it would be similar to like a sine wave kind of thing from math class or something. But as an example on the screen, one cycle is when the wave starts on the line, you have to do a peak and a valley and come back to the line. That completes a cycle. What defines the pitch is how many times that wave cycle repeats in one second. So your concert pitch of A440, whatever that particular sound wave looks like, that thing is repeating 440 times per second. The octave below it is half of that. So if this is my A440, which it's not because my guitar is a half step down, this particular guitar, so really that was, okay, to be technical, that would be A440. An octave below it would be 220, so it doubles every time it moves up an octave. So when I'm talking about pitch here, I'm not talking about perfect pitch, which only a very, very small percentage of people have. Um, so like if you were thinking this is something you need to be just be born with, uh, if we're talking perfect pitch, that may be true. In fact, there was a video, I don't know how old it is, but I seen it on Rick Beato's channel where he talks about adults not being able to develop perfect pitch. And uh, what he said was making sense. You might want to check that one out. I'm going to put a card to it. Should be up in the corner here. Um, it was an interesting video. I was a little crushed at first because I was like, oh, I want to develop that. But you know what? Really, it's not that important. What is important is your relative pitch, which would be your ability to um, recognize the distance between two notes. So being able to know, for example, like with our 
I'm just going to play the A flat so I don't confuse myself here, okay? But if I play that A and the one below it, to be able to recognize that that's an octave. If I hear somebody play this note, if I could tell them it's an A, or technically an A flat on my guitar, that would be awesome. But it's not essential to becoming a, an accomplished guitar player and, and being able to figure out your own songs. Relative pitch is what you need, and that's a totally a skill that you can develop. So one thing I would suggest is always making sure you practice in tune. You've already heard me refer to my guitar a couple times as being flat, but that's by design. Um, I have a few guitars and generally I keep them tuned differently, but you definitely want to practice in tune. Um, if for some reason you can't, like you don't have a tuner, then my next recommendation would be just practice on one string because that way at least you have your frets which are constant and as long as you're not playing on some super old strings that are just super unresponsive at least having your frets should keep your intervals consistent minor second major second minor third major third those should have that same relative difference between them regardless of whether your string you're playing on is tuned the way it should be. However, if you start crossing over strings, this is where you could run into problems and potentially confuse your ear and um, yeah, I'm not saying you're going to cause irreversible damage, but I would suggest just playing in tune and not getting your ear used to hearing those bad sounds and thinking they're normal. Okay, so the next characteristic is timbre or tone color. Um, some people even just call it tone. And this is what basically makes the guitar sound different from say a piano or a saxophone. Um, that's kind of the like macro level take on it. but. At the same time, on a micro level, you've got this same thing going on where you have these six strings that also are very unique in their own tone color. And this one's not, this one's a little tougher to quantify. Um, and if you could look at a wave, it would probably look confusing because what causes this is a series of things called undertones and overtones which um, I guess to our human ears aren't super perceptible other than to give these sounds color because uh, we're hearing the pitch you know of the note and like I mentioned before maybe that one percent or whatever of us that can say oh that's an A note are hearing that but for the rest of us we're hearing a note we probably don't really know what note it is but you can tell you know, if it's a guitar or a piano, um, from these undertones and overtones, which basically are like harmonics. And so think of it like this. If you can identify your friends or your family's voices just by listening to the sound of them speak, you definitely, you have the skills to do this, what I'm about to um, talk about with the guitar, because you know, obviously we're not comparing a guitar and a piano. What we're trying to do when we're transcribing a guitar is like, was it this E note? Or this E note? E flat for all you perfect pitchers out there. Um, so like each string has its own voice, the same way as people have their own voices, which are, you know, determined by your vocal cords, genetics, physiology probably a scientist or a doctor could explain all that better but um, your guitar strings they're unique six unique voices uh, seven if you got a seven string you get the idea though um, but the main things that contribute to their sound characteristic are, are their physical attributes which is their their diameter which is measured in thousandths of an inch 
which is why it's a lot more subtle probably. No, maybe not. Our human vocal cords probably aren't that drastically different either. But so anyway, sorry for the tangent, it would be the diameter of the string. And there's also another thing that really kind of it divides them into two groups. You got your on an electric guitar and most nylon acoustics and I don't know a lot about acoustics. A lot of steel strings though aren't like that. But on electric, your G, B, and E, your three highest strings, are what is called unwound. Meaning it's one long piece of nice smooth steel string okay and if you have a guitar you probably know what I'm talking about so I'm if I'm dumbing this down too much I apologize um, your other ones your D A and E strings are what are called wound strings so what I mean by that you've got your long basically these have a long uh, piece of steel as a core and then you've got this really tight winding kind of like almost perpendicular around the whole axis of the string that covers it um, almost all the way until the end I mean it covers it far enough that you end up clipping off whatever parts not covered but what's cool about that a couple things Those wound strings give you that scratchy noise when you scrape the edge of your pick. The unwound ones, they don't do that. They still have kind of a cool sound. But the other thing you really get is a, a certain brightness. And um, to me, the unwound strings, they just sound really like clear and they just cut through especially with some rock some good old rock and roll distortion thrown on there um, but your bass or wound strings the D A and E they just to me sound a little fuller warmer um, almost with more of like a fuzzy kind of tone to them with distortion on anyway but if you can get used to that distinction uh, and and having that shortcut that you know there's kind of two classes so your string is going to fall into either these three or those three I think that is a good shortcut to focus on uh, and you can do this just when you're listening to music in the car you know I do it all the time if you listen into like uh, Black Sabbath album and I'm like oh did he just cross over from wound strings to unwound strings I wonder if that's the G string or the B string so you got those kind of things. And then another kind of a, I don't want to say shortcut, but a definite different sound you can listen for is simply. If you didn't get what I'm getting at right there, open strings. Open strings have, they, they have just a different sound to them than their equivalent fretted notes. Um, now with the low E, there's only that, so there's nothing to compare to, but with like the A note, this one's brighter and a little more trebly. This one sounds like a, a thicker note that's kind of like being fretted and, you know, they just don't sound the same. Who knows? There's probably a lot of science behind that I'll research and we'll cover this more in depth at a later time as well so as far as timbre and tone color those are my my best beginner tips for you to kind of work on and just being able to recognize the difference between the brightness and the warmness of the unwound and then that just ringing clarity of an open string all right and lastly and probably the easiest one to kind of cover the third topic would be the articulation or execution of how the notes are played. And like, I'd say one of the biggest categories is, and this one's not super like cut and dry, it's staccato versus legato. 
So you got staccato versus legato, but there's a lot of middle ground there too. Like, to put it in black and white terms, this is staccato. This is legato. Or this could be legato. So legato is like smooth, flowing, you know. Uh, staccato is very choppy. But between the two, you also have... I'm picking every note. So there's that pick attack, which it's not really staccato, but it's definitely not legato. So you kind of got, I guess, um, three degrees to look out there for. Legato, staccato, and just straight up picking. Speaking of which, the other thing to listen for, besides those basic um, guidelines, is how is the note being articulated? Is it being picked? Are some of them being hammered on? Are there pull-offs? So generally, well not generally, hammer-ons are ascending, meaning the pitch goes up. Pull-offs are going to be descending. It's kind of like the same, but opposite. And we'll get into like the specific techniques on that at some other point in time. We're just trying to generally give you some guidelines here for improving your ear to transcribe. Uh, okay, so besides your staccato, legato, and, and how the note's actually being played, Another thing to look at for how the note could be being played is potential equipment and effects. Like, is every note truly being played? Or perhaps there might be a delay pedal involved? Uh, you know, other kinds of echo, repeat. You gotta look out for, sometimes wah pedal can distort the sound enough to make it a little less clear what's going on. So um, if you can be, you know, aware of what kind of effects your artists that you enjoy use, that certainly helps too. Another thing to be aware of is simply dynamics. Um, you know, fading in and out on notes. Uh, kind of like my running with the devil lesson I did last few weeks. There's a lot of dynamics in that song because you got to pay attention to accenting certain notes, picking lighter, especially, I mean, he was playing on a Marshall Plexi and that thing is super responsive to pick attack. And um, also regarding equipment, you got, you know, was a special kind of guitar used? I mean, if a guy is playing on a seven string guitar and you're trying to learn it on a six string guitar, unless he's never using that seventh string, you might have a hard time um, figuring out exactly all the riffs. Uh, another one that jumps out to me as a huge Van Halen fan, of course he's got a few songs where he uses the trans trem guitar, which basically, I've never used one so I don't even totally know how it works, but it lets you take the whammy bar and somehow just, abs it's, it's kind of like using a capo, but you can adjust it on the fly with the whammy, and he does it on like Summer Nights on 5150, and the song Get Up, and I don't think he used it really again until the Me Wise Magic song back in 96, but um, that's a cool trick. But if you didn't know he was using that and you tried to figure out some of those songs, you'd probably be like, whoa, how the heck is this going on? So do your homework. Be aware of the equipment. Hey, if you're getting value from this video, please be sure and hit the old thumbs up button and subscribe so you won't uh, miss any more videos like this. There will be many more coming up. And also, if you'd like to see some of my own transcribing skills in action, make sure and check out my best online running with the devil guitar lesson. So in case you think I forgot, here's that bonus tip I was talking about earlier. Um, if you don't actively pursue these skills and knowledge, um, Eventually, you may very well just kind of start to get some of it. 
Um, but I'm going to tell you, if you do this with intent now, you can start developing those skills and you'll be so much better off for it. Why wait? Don't waste years like I did. The only thing holding you back is you. So are these the only things you need to know for transcribing? Oh, of course not. But I do believe they are the three foundational things from which everything else will flow, at least for guitar. And like I said, you can start now um, when you're practicing, listening to music. When you're practicing, of course, you know which string you're playing, but still listen to it anyways. Pay attention. Internalize it. Develop that, that recognition. This is how it sounds on this string. This is what this string sounds like. It may sound overwhelming, but, you know, I, I promise if you stick with this, you'll get it. And it's so rewarding. I can't even really put it into words. And then, of course, you'll need to know some rhythm and timing things. I mean, that's part of music, too. I'm not trying to gloss over all that stuff. Um, but some of that has its own little tricky things, and, and I'll definitely touch on that in a separate video in the future, along with further breakdowns of these three kind of topics that I hit on today. But I just wanted to give you guys these three kind of tips to get you going and let you know that you, this is within reach. You can definitely figure out your own songs and you'll be a much better player and musician for doing so. That I can promise.